Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another club I've met. Great to see so many people tuning in. Uh, I'll give it a few minutes here. It looks like people are still coming into the waiting room. And now we have to admit people one at a time. <laughs> I should say good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I see people from all over the place. <laughs> okay. All right, Johnny, seems like things are slowing down. Okay, yeah, I'll go. Ahead. Yeah, I think it's a good, yep. Okay, my name's Charlie Nunn. I'm at Duke University. I run the Triangle Center for Evolutionary Anthropology, uh, and I'm the uh, organizer of Club Med, along with our organizing committee. Uh, welcome to Club Ev Med. We like to call it Club Ev Med Conversations uh, to really emphasize that we want to have an actual dialogue, an actual conversation around some topic. Um, you know, the goal is really just to bring people together, um, ideally from different fields, uh, to hear about the latest findings in evolutionary medicine, uh, and then to to hear different people's perspectives, hear questions, you know, things like that. We'll run the session for about fifty minutes or so. Um, we have about a 20, 25 minute talk and then, you know, we'll open up for questions. I understand the speaker's also uh, happy to have interruptions. If you have any questions during the talk, uh, type, type them into the chat um, or just feel free to raise your hand and, and uh, ask a question. Um, Club at Med is organized by the International Society, for, International Society for Evolution, Medicine and Public Health. Um, we are also organized by eight, now eight. It used to be six and now we're up to eight different uh, evolutionary medicine groups and centers. Um, our newest one uh, is from University of Kiel. I see Hinrich, Hinrich is uh, here uh, with us as one of the organizers, uh, and that includes the Kiel Evolution Center and Trans Evo. Um, uh, do you want to say anything, Hinrich? Okay, okay. putting him on the spot. <laughs> Um, our, our... No, I could, could just add, we're, we're happy to join in and uh, we we have established um, in our curriculum um, at different levels and research consortia on uh, evolutionary medicine and therefore it fits perfectly and we're very happy to join in. Well, welcome aboard. Uh, so Henrich and um, uh, John Baines are going to be on the organizing committee uh for club of med and i'm um, looking forward to hearing uh your perspectives on the series and and highlighting some of the people from the the, or, the groups at keel that uh are involved in this uh, that's keel evolution center and trans evo uh, that stands for trans evo is translational evolutionary research um we also had last week a brazilian group join uh the brazilian evolution and health study group um and uh, maybe some of the members from that group are with us today as well Okay, as I said, please participate in the conversation. You know, post questions in the chat as the talk goes along, share your perspectives, ask questions. If it looks like a clarifying question, uh, we'll interrupt the speaker and, and try to get some clarification. Um, at the end, we'll have time for questions. Just raise your hand virtually, use that ra you know virtual raise hand feature, um, and we'll call on people. We'll also probably ask some questions uh, from the chat. Uh, so, on to the introduction. I'm really happy today to introduce David Weiss uh, from Emory University. Um, you know, it's it's great to to finally connect with him and to have this opportunity to hear about his research. And this is actually a series that we're having in Club of Med on wins in evolutionary medicine. You know, where are the places where evolutionary perspectives have really had an impact on you know understanding human health and and ideally in this case we're really focused on uh treatment of human health conditions um david has a phd from nyu uh, in microbiology where he focused on the toll-like uh receptors and uh, fighting uh bacterial infections did a postdoc at stanford uh, he researched virulence mechanisms and the role of the inflammasome uh, in host defenses and currently, he's a professor at Emory University, where he has a bunch of different <laughs> affiliations and posts. Uh, he's in the Division of Infectious Disease and at the Emory Vaccine Center. Uh, he's also the director of the Antibiotic Resistance Center. Um, and he has an appointment at the Emory uh, National Research Primate Research Center. His lab studies antibiotic resistance. Uh, I bet a lot of you know about his work. Uh, including how hetero resistance might be exploited to overcome the challenges of antibiotic resistance. And if you don't know what hetero resistance is, um, you you will soon. Uh, with that, I'll turn things over uh, to David. Thanks very much for joining us, David. 
Okay. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, Charlie and Johnny, for the you know nice invitation. This is pretty cool to speak to such a diverse group, both like in expertise and geographically as well. Um, so yeah, and in part because of that, um, please don't be shy to interrupt me um, if anything is not clear. I'm happy to uh, clarify. Um, and I guess I will oh, get going here. Um, so yeah, I think I'll talk about what is hetero resistance, uh, what are the problems with it, that the you know, the concerns, but then also this this thing we were led to um in uh how do we how can we exploit it for good, hopefully. Um and so, you know, hope I'm I'm sure people have heard that antibiotic resistance is a huge problem. Um the you know, this is not on this slide, but now a recent paper in The Lancet showed or estimated that there are currently 1.27 million deaths uh, due to antibiotic resistance worldwide um, every year. And that's more than HIV and malaria combined at the moment. Um, this is a study that projects that by the year 2050, there would be 10 million deaths uh, per year it, due to antibiotic resistance if we don't take significant action, which at that time would outpace cancer. So this is huge. And then I think another thing to keep in mind is not just, you know, we think of infections as you get an infection and what fighting off the infection, but what about the broader impact it would have on society? So if we didn't have effective antibiotics, um, extremely premature infants would probably not be able to survive. Um, transplants would probably become a thing of the past uh, because immunosuppressed patients, also cancer patients who are immunosuppressed, would not be able to survive. And I've heard of cases actually at the moment where some pan-resistant, totally resistant to all drugs available, Klebsiella, um, are so prevalent in some regions of India that cancer patients, some cancer patients there, have actually chosen not to get cancer treatment um, because they think they will live longer if they just ride out the cancer than get the immunosuppressive um, treatments and then they'll be get a Klebsiella infection that they can't fight off um, with drugs. So that is really kind of shocking and to hear um, that someone would make a choice like that. And that is what antibiotic resistance um, can do. So to help figure out and combat and come up with strategies um, and study this problem, we set up the Emory Antibiotic Resistance Center. Emory's fantastic, is very collegial, which is really the foundation of this center. And the goal was to link uh, clinicians, clinical microbiologists, epidemiologists, and basic scientists all together. And then the project that I'll talk about completely came out of this effort and wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and so I'll show here, this is an e-test strip for anyone who doesn't know. It's one antibiotic in the strip, colistin, but it's at different concentrations. So high concentration here and a gradient um, to very low concentrations. This is a lawn of bacteria, and you can see that the zone of clearing is where the, sorry, where the antibiotics cannot, uh, where the bacteria cannot survive is greater where there's more drug and smaller where there's uh, less drug. So that makes sense. And this is like a typical image of a strain that's susceptible to this drug colistin. Um, this is an image of a strain that's resistant, and you can see a much smaller zone of clearing. And then this is what uh, this talk is really about. Um, so this strain, it has the big zone of clearing like the susceptible strain, but then it has these breakthrough colonies and showing you that there's more than one population here. There are some resistant cells, but also many susceptible. And that is an example of hetero resistance. Um, and so this is an isolate of Enterobacter. And this was brought to my attention, the head of the clinical micro lab 
called me on the phone actually and said, I have a strain that looks really weird. I haven't seen this before. You should check it out. And that uh, initial event then incubate for like seven years. And this is what I'm talking about is what we've come up with. Um, I do just quickly want to highlight that if anyone has heard of hetero resistance before in different, when studying different bacteria, people use the term a little bit differently. So for uh, TB um, and Helicobacter, they often talk about it as like two distinct uh, stable populations, like isolated from different parts of the lung, for example, and that these are totally genetically distinct strains. What we are talking about is two populations that are genetically um, identical that are behaving in, in different ways, as you'll see. Okay, so just quickly, this is a population analysis profile or PAP, and you'll see a bunch of these in, in the talk. So here we're just, all we're doing is plotting uh, percent surviving bacteria at many different increasing concentrations of drug. And you can see a susceptible strain is killed at a low concentration of drug. That makes sense. What's important here is that there's uniform killing. The population behaves uh, similarly. For a resistant strain, you see the same thing, except they can survive up to a much higher amount of drug because they're resistant. But again, they behave uniformly when they're killed. And the heteroresistant strain that I showed you over here in this PAP uh, analysis looks like this. So you get 90% of the cells are killed at a low dose. But then what survives, the small population of surviving cells is incredibly resistant and has, you know, at least a 500 fold um, increased MIC um, or minimum inhibitory concentration. So it can survive up to 500 times more drug. So incredible uh, resistance and discrepancy between these two populations. Um, and so we called it RS because uh, it has both populations. And at that time, we didn't know what, what really we were studying and we're not super creative with uh, names apparently. So, okay, so what happens uh, if we just treat and look over time in the lab at a strain like this. And so you see initial killing and then outgrowth of the population. And what's important, so one feature of heteroresistance that distinguishes it from other uh, forms of resistance is that this initial killing is down to the level of the pre-existing resistant population. So at time zero, there were already a resist. There was already a resistant population. Susceptible cells are killed, and then the resistant cells can grow out. Um, importantly, this means that they're able to replicate in the presence of antibiotic, and that means that they are not persisters, uh, which is another type of resistant subpopulation. For persisters, what happens is the cells just stop. Uh, growing basically, they stop being very metabolically active. And because of their inaction, they just sort of go dormant and sit and don't get killed. But the flip side of that is they're not able to cause an acute um, treatment failure. Uh, and so that's very different than what we're seeing here. The other thing is that, so I've already showed this, that if you treat with drug, you can enrich the resistant population. Now, if we subsequently from here take away the antibiotic and grow again without drug present, if this were a stable resistance mutation, we would see uh, the frequency of the resistance cells would remain the same. But what we see is after, actually in this case, after one overnight um, without drug, we see a reversion of the frequency of the resistance cells back to baseline. Um, and this is really interesting. It shows, one, that this is a flexible and unstable phenomenon. Um, so, and let me just say that a strain that's heteroresistant will very stably remain heteroresistant if we test it, you know, 100 different times. I'm just saying that the frequency of the resistant cells is unstable and greatly uh, depends on the environment and whether the drug is present. So this is not, uh, when when you see enrichment of the resistance cells, it's not a 
point mutation or a stable mutation that will be carried forward. Okay, so then the big question for us was, does any of this matter? Um, so we go into a mouse model and we give a susceptible strain, a high dose lethal infection. So you can see the mice succumb to infection. But if we treat with colistin, we get survival. So colistin works in this model. However, uh, when we do the same experiment with this heteroresistant strain, we don't see uh, any survival. So they the, the mice fail um, therapy. Um, and I see that there is a question about similar phenomenon for resistance to bacteriophages. I believe there is. Um, I don't think it's been in the literature called heteroresistance, but I think it's been described. Um, and yes, in uh, there's there's a paper from you know I think decades ago where this has been observed. And I should also say that I think the first time that heteroresistance was described uh, and not given that name was probably something like 1947. Um, so this is not new uh, as a phenomenon. It's been it's very uncertain uh, how it has affected uh, treatment outcome or what are the mechanisms controlling it. And that's really what we are looking into here. OK, so this can cause treatment failure. But, you know, at least in the clinic, this strain was identified as having some resistance. That's why they called us in the first place to look at it. So we dug more after finding this weird strain. And we found that there were, we found another strain, which was similar, except for one big difference. The frequency of the resistant cells in this isolate is much lower. So like one in 10,000, one in 100,000, depending on concentration. So if you treat uh, this strain or a mouse infected with this strain, you would expect to get killing of 99.999% of the cells. Um, and what we see is, again, here's a control. Um, even though there were so few resistant cells in this case, we still see treatment failure. Um, when using colistin to treat a mouse infected with that strain. And the most worrisome part was that the e-test for this strain looks like this. It's completely clear in the zone of clearing here. Um, none of those breakthrough colonies because the frequency of the resistant population is so low that it doesn't show up on this e-test or in this area. And so this strain would be classified susceptible. A clinician would think, Oh, the lab says susceptible, it's safe to treat a patient with colistin who's infected with this strain, and then you could have a treatment failure. So one of the worries about heteroresistance is that it can be um, undetected and then potentially lead to treatment failure. So another question, I mean, everything has been for this drug called colistin so far. So we went, we're lucky at Emory to have access to all these different surveillance networks. So um, we dug into those as looked for some other drugs. And what we found was heteroresistance for every drug and every antibiotic that we evaluated in different classes of antibiotics, um, very diverse. The rate varies depending on the drug, but it's there for all of them. So this was sort of shocking to find this thing that people are not detecting. I should also say that um, the clinical lab has no designation for heteroresistance. So every isolate will be classified to a given drug, either resistant or susceptible, but there is no designation for heteroresistance. So to find this, in some cases, 50% of the strains have this phenotype that is not being classified, um, I guess, sensitively enough or correctly or fully, and instead being lumped into one of these two other buckets was surprising. Um, and now I'll just, just to say that, so one of the big questions is always, does heteroresistance really matter um, clinically? So um, I apologize, I can't say more about this because it's in collaboration with a company and we're not allowed to share details yet, but there was a clinical trial of 291 patients with complicated urinary tract infection. This is using a beta-lactam antibiotic 
and we were able to get these isolates and test them and correlate with the outcome data. And you can see that the heteroresistant patients with infected with heteroresistant isolates um, failed more so than those with um, susceptible strains. And so this is some of the most robust and still yet unpublished data highlighting that heteroresistance can indeed um, cause treatment failure in humans or is more, more likely to cause treatment failure. Um, and then I think, so this is just showing that among the isolates that are tested for these 16 antibiotics that I showed you, the clinical designation for each um, strain antibiotic pair is either resistant or susceptible. And you can see these are pretty resistant. There's only some less susceptibility than resistant, but the heteroresistance spans both. And you can see that here as well. So if we take on average the um, a strain and antibiotic pair that was classified susceptible by the clinical lab, but it was heteroresistant in our hands, it has a you know one in 10 to the four um, frequency of the resistant subpopulation at a concentration that's the breakpoint, clinical breakpoint of the drug. If you take a strain that was classified resistant, but it's heteroresistant in our hands, it will have the reason it was detected as being resistant is because there's on average two log higher frequency. So heteroresistance can be, as I said, classified susceptible like these or resistant like these. And this depends on the frequency of the resistant cells. Um, let's see, forgiven, are there? Yes. Um, so for a given antibiotic, um, yeah, like so um, Klebsiella, for example, will be more often uh, res heteroresistant to meropenem, which is a carbapenem, than let's say a less um, antibiotic resistant bug. Um, and I think this can also vary geographically. So I would say for any, um, there are definitely differences in frequencies uh, that are predictable, but overall you still, to know whether a given isolate like from a, a patient is gonna be heteroresistant to a certain drug or not, every isolate has to be tested individually. Um, and so this is also really like a great case for um, personalized medicine. Um, okay, so we noticed something interesting that looking at these 16 drugs, almost the vast majority uh, of the strains were heteroresistant to two or more drugs. And so we called that multiple heteroresistance. And here's one example um, showing the curve for colistin. This is one strain, ceftazidime, a beta-lactam, and phosphomycin. And you can see that in these different um, curves, they're, they're all a little bit different. So this gave us a clue that maybe these subpopulations of resistant cells are not all the same. It's not like a jackpot population of cells that resist every antibiotic. And so we investigated that a little further. This is just a control to show that for ampicillin, this is classical resistance. You just have 100% of the cells are resistant. So just because a strain is heteroresistant to many drugs doesn't mean it can't be resistant, susceptible to others. And so we explored this question a little more of the distinct subpopulations. So we knock out a gene, FOQ, in this strain that um, is required for the colistin resistant population. And you can see when we knock out FOQ, we lose those resistant cells. However, the subpopulation resistant to phosphomycin or ceftazidime remains unchanged. And when we do the same thing for phosphomycin, we knock out FOS A, a resistance gene for phosphomycin. The phosphomycin resistant population is gone the others remain. And same thing for ceftazidime with the AMP R mutant. So I think what's amazing here, or at least to me, this is not what I was taught in grad school. Um, there are, you know, you pick a single colony, all the cells are supposed to be the same. 
Um, but actually, when you grow a culture and you look at this tube, um, there's like potpourri in there. There's a lot of uh, variation in terms of what these cells are doing. Um, and not just um, stochastic variation of, you know, small differences, but in some cases, 500 fold differences in the MIC to an antibiotic. Um, and so one question this graph makes me think of this slide is how many of these different one in 10,000 or one in 100 are there in one population? And I think it's much broader than than what we've thought in the past. So, OK, where did all of this go? So I think Charlie mentioned like using what we learn about how resistance is evolving to actually to be functional potentially in the clinic. So we were trying to prove further that these populations were distinct and we thought okay if they're really distinct we should get um, enhanced killing if we treat with a combination so if a strain if a resistant population is present one in a hundred thousand or one in a thousand um if we were and the, and they're distinct if we were to combine these two drugs there would be extremely few cells that are resistant to both antibiotics and so we investigated um, whether that uh, was the case or not. Um, sorry, and there's a question, 30% or so of complicated UTI. Um, good question about host issues. I don't know. Um, uh, we don't have all of that for the background of all the patients, but we do know that there were a significant amount were diabetic. Um, so yes, and the other issue is with UTIs, we can also get failure um, if they are in these, Scott Holtgren has described these bladder intracellular communities where they get shielded from the antibiotics. They can also form biofilms on catheters. And we saw more failure if there were um, non-removable catheters uh, there was a higher rate of failure. So I think some of the failure rate is due to the hetero resistance, but then there's in both groups, there's this background of higher failure rate due to um, other problems of bugs being shielded, uh, forming biofilms like from the antibiotic completely. So I think the high rate was a combination of those things. Okay, so here what we're showing is this strain that is heteroresistant to multiple drugs. Here's the curve for colistin and phosphomycin. Now, if these populations are distinct, we should be able to, and, and we treat with both drugs, just mathematically, this dashed line shows the amount of killing that we would expect to get. And so then we did this experimentally, and the purple line shows the actual experimental data, and you can see it fits really well. Um, we did the same thing for uh, colistin and ceftazidime, and it matches pretty well. And you see the same thing um, for the last combination. So interestingly, um, I mentioned this strain was resistant to ampicillin. So if we do a combination of ampicillin where every single cell is resistant with colistin, we don't see any additive killing at all. So um, we only see this when the strain is heteroresistant to both drugs that we get this predictable, predictable additive um, killing, but not when it's resistant to one. Okay, so now we did a big screen. Uh, we took eight clinical isolates, but we screened them against 16 drugs and every combo, dual combo, two drug combo. That So that's 120 combos. And then what the data I'm gonna show is focused on for any given strain, when the two, when the clinic said by standard test that the, the strain was resistant to both antibiotics. And then we're going to take those and separate them by our testing into, well, were they really resistant to both drugs or were they hetero resistant to both? And when we look at the efficacy, we see a really huge um, difference here. So when the clinic said the strain was resistant to both drugs, and we agree 100% of the cells are resistant to both drugs. We see the vast majority of the time, no killing. Um, very few instances here of 
what would be called synergy. What I learned in grad school was synergy. Um, but in contrast, when the strain is heteroresistant to both drugs, even though the clinic thinks that it's resistant to both, we see on average four to five logs of killing. So this was really exciting. And I think what, what this really means is like this idea of drug synergy. You know, I learned that one drug might be, let's say, targeting the cell membrane and damaging it so the second drug can get in and they're working together in that way. And that synergy basically relies on combined action on the same cell. Our data are suggesting that in the vast majority of cases of synergy, because these would be classified as synergy, um, that you're actually just seeing an additive effect of two separate drugs doing individual work on their own, but targeting different cells. And so this has really changed, um, at least with these strains and these drugs in our hands, has changed our view of synergy. Okay, so um, I'll wrap up. Um, there was a woman who had gone to India. She got infected with a pan-resistant Klebsiella, came back to the U.S. She had broke her leg in India and got this in the hospital there, it seems like. And she died um, in the U.S. when this uh, infection flared up. This is an antibiogram or partial antibiogram of her strain, so resistant to everything. We got that strain from CDC, and um, it was actually heteroresistant to several drugs. Um, when we use the combination, uh, per, the combination based on this um, prediction of which ones are HR, let's combine those. We see the predicted killing. We see that uh, when we treat with either single drug, you get an effect of killing, but then outgrowth. With the combo, we don't see that. With uh, the combo, you can see the culture is totally clear. And this combination was able to rescue mice infected with that strain. So suggesting that this woman, maybe there were treatment options for her, but it's just that when the clinician is looking at all ours, it's not obvious which to combine. And we think our data on the heteroresistance helps guide combination therapy. And I'll just highlight that one, a clinical case where, so this happened in Atlanta, a patient had a kidney transplant. They got an infection again with pan-resistant Klebsiella. This had two carbapenemases. Um, it was, it looked more or less untreatable. The clinicians asked us to, in real time, to check into this. And we found that actually the meropenem and colistin were hetero-resistant. The patient was on tigacycline. That was not working. They got switched to meropenem colistin based on these data. And in an incredibly short time, they became culture negative. And so this has actually gotten rid of their um, infection, which threatened their transplant, actually. They could have lost their kidney transplant if this had ascended. And so final thing I'll say here is just this is what we envision as potentially the future, that you see an antibiogram now, and it looks like this. You don't know, the clinician doesn't know which susceptible to rely on necessarily. If we, if the antibiogram looked like this, you could exclude all these HRs and choose from one of the drugs that is the strain is really susceptible to. And we think that would increase the efficacy of monotherapy. And then likewise for combination therapy, if everything looks R, how do you know which to combine, even we could get uh, information on the frequency of the resistant cells and choose the drugs that to which there's the lowest frequency of resistance and vastly improved combination therapy. So we hope that will be the future. Um, obviously, this case that I showed you was N of one, there's only a couple handful of others. So ultimately, we would need like clinical trials and stuff to see if this really bears out. And then just to thank my lab, who's done you know amazing work uh, with all of this, these um, the environment at Emory, like the clinical lab and surveillance networks. Otherwise, you know this whole project wouldn't have happened. I didn't even know what hetero resistance was when this started, um, and funding, and then definitely help wanted. 
we are hiring. Uh, we have a bunch of turnover coming up as people leave the lab, graduate, go to faculty positions. So please come and join us if you're interested. Um, we have other microbiome projects as well. So if there's anything here, I'm happy to, uh, that interests you, I'm happy to chat further. Um, and thank you so much. And I, I think I'm behind on the, the questions here. <laughs> Thank you, David. That was fantastic. Thanks for a great talk. Yeah, we do have some questions in the chat. And, um, you know, we also want to have questions from the audience. I thought I might just ask if uh, it were, I think there are about four questions now that have been put in the chat uh, that haven't been answered yet. Uh, Maya, Peter, Michelle, yep. Neil, if any of you would like to raise your hand and ask your questions, go ahead. We have some other folks as well. Uh, Henrich, why don't you start? Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, David. That was a very interesting, fascinating talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, I was wondering, do you, do you have any information whether the resistance subpopulation of the strains you, you have tested, whether resistance is stable or is it always unstable? Because that, that could make an important difference to treatment recommendations. Yeah. That's a great question. And here, you know, when, especially for talking to this group, I realized we have some, a piece of data that um, gets at your question and that I think um, would be very relevant. So let me see, I was just trying to pull this up. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, yeah. so this gets at your question. So I think the resist, the hetero resistance, as I, the resistant cells are unstable, but you, of course, you can have events where a heteroresistant strain overall could evolve to have a different phenotype, like, for example, resistance. So what we did here is to look at that. Um, we took, so this is a little twisted and imperfect. So just like bear with me for a minute. So we took a hundred isolates roughly, and we looked only at their um, susceptibility status to beta-lactam antibiotics. And so the beta-lactams have been introduced over a long period of time, right? So the ones that are years since clinical introduction, this would be like ampicillin. It's been around 60 years. This one over here would be like ceftazidime avibactam combination. And in between their drugs like meropenem and cefepime. And so what we saw, um, so this is not longitudinal. This is kind of like using year of introduction as a full way of looking at getting a, a first glimpse of maybe what could happen evolutionarily. So you see that for the for these hundred strains that they're almost all resistant to the earliest introduced Bay-lactam, but almost all susceptible to the newest, which makes sense. But what was interesting is that we got this completely distinct signature here, where the drugs that have been around for an intermediate amount of time, that hetero resistance was often among the most like dominant phenotypes. So overall, this kind of suggests that susceptibility may uh, emerge into hetero resistance before evolving full resistance. And that if you weren't uh, testing for hetero resistance, because so, and just keep this in mind, I showed when the frequency of the resistant population is very low, even though there's hetero resistance, they're still classified susceptible. And when the frequency of the resistant cells is very high, they're classified resistant by standard tests. So I can show you this same graph and I can say, what would the clinical designation be? And it would just look like S turning into R. But because we're using this approach that is sensitive to find this intermediate phenotype, you see that there's actually this, this seeming like progression here. And so that suggests that hetero resistance may be an evolutionary intermediary um, along the progression to resistance. So that it may be 
for many reasons. Like you can think about fitness costs. You know, if you haven't really worked out how to be super resistant with one point mutation that you just get like the perfect point mutation, it may be super costly, right? Because you it may really have a big fitness cost or effect on virulence. So maybe having a subpopulation that's resistant. So it's there when you need them to rely on them so that your your strain doesn't die out in the face of antibiotic is an intermediate way to prolong survival at, before you emerge, uh, develop full resistance. So this is, and I just want to say like these data do not in any way prove what I just am suggesting, but I think they are... Um, suggest that there could that could be something that's happening and ultimately we would need you know longitudinal data and more mechanistic looking at how you know the genomics of the strains to prove that but um i think yeah so we think it may at least in some cases be an intermediary okay thank you okay thanks for that question um i'm just just to try to clarify something because i'm a little confused now so I thought that the the hetero resistance was not um, uh, genetically based, not mutationally based. Yeah. So sorry. This is. I guess I didn't do a good enough job of explaining this. So, um, okay. The is it like a phenotypic plasticity response. Yeah. Like yeah. There are two different to an environment. Yeah. There are two different things here. So there's if you can if you look at a susceptible strain where hundred percent of the cells are susceptible and a hetero-resistant strain where you have two populations, they will have to be genetically different. Something is controlling this difference in phenotype, and um, it is it is genetic. And then we can talk about like what that can be. Now, within the hetero-resistant strain, the susceptible and resistant populations um, may or may not have a slight genetic difference. So we have cases where they have no genetic difference whatsoever. Um, and so in that way, I mean, the, the resistance is not stable, but still the phen the overall phenotype of heteroresistance is stable. Another thing that can lead to heteroresistance is gene amplification. So if you imagine you have a resistance gene like a beta-lactamase, um, what we've seen often, and Don Anderson, who's in at Uppsala in Sweden, he was one of the first to really characterize this broadly. Um, he's showed that you can get with tandem repeats that are flanking the beta lactamase, you can get small populations that have two copies, five copies, 12 copies of the beta lactamase resistance gene, and then they will be more resistant to the drug. And so you get this continuum of fewer cells that are more resistant based on having more copies. And it's kind of like a genetic accordion where, you know, the strain overall on average in different conditions will have more or fewer uh, copies based on whether the drug is there or not, or how much of the drug is there. So that's one mechanism that there can be an unstable genetic like plasticity underlying this. That's fascinating. Um, okay, let's go to Michelle next, uh, an infectious disease doctor from New Orleans. Go ahead, Michelle. Michelle Blight. Hey, <laughs> um, thank you so much for that lecture. It was really interesting. Actually, I just emailed my uh, my chair about it, but um, cool. kind Thanks. of related to some of these conversations that we're having. Um, with regards to the hetero resistance, is this does this have anything to do with effect like bacterial sign signaling of themselves? Um, does it have anything to do with the conditions in which you know they're they're replicating or whatever? Or is this kind of just about being exposed to antibiotics or or something else? Yeah, good question. So I mean, definitely being exposed to the antibiotic is like the simplest way that we can test to see this. But I would say we've definitely seen other um, conditions come into play. Um, so in some cases, there can be a link to like the metabolic environment that's out there. So, I mean, if you um, like I saw you mentioned Pseudomonas and someone mentioned before cystic fibrosis. 
so that's going to be an incredibly different um environment obviously like in a cf lung versus an acute infection so i think we're just at the beginning of learning how how those could impact this i guess just one other thing to throw out there that i didn't include um that the host can have a big impact here so you know, colistin, which I spoke about first, is a cationic antimicrobial peptide antibiotic. Our innate immune system has and relies on other cationic antimicrobial peptides, like um, LL37, um, lysozyme is cationic. So what we saw is actually if we take that heteroresistant strain um, and we put it into a mouse, and we don't treat with colistin, even though it's heteroresistant to colistin, there's no colistin around, the host antimicrobials can start to select for the colistin resistant cells because they're cross resistant. And that then by the time you would treat with colistin, um, you've already enriched the resistant population. And that the clinical lab wouldn't know that this happens because it's a reversible phenotype when grown in the absence of drug, which is what they do in the clinical lab to passage and isolate strains. So um, I, hopefully that gets to your question, but like the host can definitely have an impact as well. And, you know, those are some of the things we have to study. What are the different environmental conditions that could drive heteroresistance? And, and if there are um, some, is it even possible that the environmental conditions uh, drove the evolution of heteroresistance, and that in some cases that can now cause a problem in the setting of antibiotic resistant. Thank you so much. That, that did answer my questions. It also makes me question a lot of my practice now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can. I just throw out there really quickly. Um, so we we do this only as like a research service, but there have been times that clinicians at different uh, universities, um, at least in the US, we can for sure do this. If you have a, some pan resistant strain, and it's not clear how to test, you can ship it to us, we can test in two days, and try to differentiate what's hetero resistant from resistant. And um, so like I said, at Emory, that was used, I guess you could say to help drive um, therapy. Um, officially, we just provide results and say, you know, this is research use only, and these are the results we got in the lab, and then you do with that what you want. But we're happy to test strains if there's some someone who, you know, is really kind of backed against the wall in terms of like what to use. Um, we can do that. Excellent. That's that's also great to know. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, Neil. Um, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, so the last question I had in the chat was about the prefix super, which is thrown around a great deal, I think, inadvisedly. I'm curious what your view are, your view is, but it, it relates to two underlying issues, which is uh, I'm still not entirely clear on what the genetic mechanisms are or epigenetic mechanisms that account for heteroresistance. But the question that naturally arises is, Whatever those changes are, whether they're actual changes of DNA sequence or changes other than DNA sequence changes, do they have any impact on resistance to immune mechanisms? Um, and I have one other thought. Uh, I think that was. Hmm. Um, hold on one second. Um, or virulence, uh, you know, okay. of the bacteria. And so my guess is that in some cases, maybe there's no cost to fitness, but I would expect in some cases there will be. And yeah. that's why I discourage use of super. Because yeah. it presents an image of a strain that I think is not evolutionarily tenable. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. I think when I think the super was in the headline from, you know, like a news headline that I was showing. Um, it was I also, think, wasn't it on your website? Oh, possibly like of our. Yeah, that's probably the case, too. Yes. Those have a little bit slightly different audiences. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, superbugs is a term that like the public, I think, has associated with this problem. So for a lay audience, I think, you know, just it's imperfect, maybe scientifically for sure. But I think, you know, however we can connect with the public is better than not connecting with them if that's the choice. I, I don't think we know that we couldn't connect with them without using that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So it's on our website just because the, you know, for a lay audience, they that's the term that many people remember. But definitely I would favor um, pan resistant, like a more scientific functional term. So I totally agree with you. Um, and then as, as far as fitness costs, um, Don Anderson, again, he has done a bunch of work showing that there are fitness costs to this gene amplification mechanism that I mentioned, and that you will get reversion in the absence of drug, you will right. get reversion um, based on you know, the intensity of that fitness cost, essentially. Right. Um, so yeah, I absolutely think that, um, and some of these mechanisms, like for example, uh, it's known that with colistin resistant cells, their whole membrane changes because the way that the bugs resist this cationic drug is to ch increase the charge of their whole surface. And so that has a lot of other effects. Make it more those. positive. Yeah, those strains grow um, much more slowly in vitro. Yeah. Like it's really obvious. But the other implication for therapy would be that perhaps in some cases, combining immune therapy as well as combining antibiotics would be effective in some cases. Certainly worth exploring. Right, absolutely. I mean, I think, well, so fundamentally, the question of how do antibiotics really work and how do does the host improve from infection after treatment with antibiotics, I would say is not known. It's definitely thought, obviously, that part of the equation is the antibiotic directly killing the infecting bacteria. But like what percentage of the clearance of the bugs are coming from the host immune system clearing weakened bugs or killed bugs or helping to stamp out the few resistant ones that emerge? Uh, I think is a complete black box. Like I haven't seen a study that has actually measured anything like that. So I think that's that I agree is like a super interesting area for the future. Thank you. Thought it was a very interesting talk. Very stimulating. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, there's just one last question, I think, uh, which is kind of a One Health question that Sophia posted uh, in the chat. I'm sure there's plenty to go around with human infections, but there are collab. Are there collaborations also with companion animal UTIs involving recalcitrant infections. Uh, so any collaborations with the veterinarians and. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have any um, collaborations with veterinarians or anything, but I'm certain that the bugs are doing the same thing. Right. So um, like I have a dog, I told the vet that if they ever have an infection they can't treat, we can like do the same testing. So, I mean, this is not like a hot area, I don't think, but you know, I I would not imagine that the biology is any different. So if, um, if you know any vets who are interested, I'm happy to chat with them. Yeah. Excellent. I think we have a few on this call. <laughs> so they might oh, okay, great. Yeah. I have not spoken to a vet audience before, but I'm thrilled to have done so. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, David. This was a fantastic uh, presentation. I learned a lot. I think we all did. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time. It's great to see everyone. Uh, before we go, Johnny, what's up next on Club of Med? What's our next uh, talk? So we have uh, Jacob Scott. Um, in his group, but they are scheduled for two weeks from now. So you'll be seeing a flyer with just a photo and um, a biography with so an abstract to come. <laughs> and this is like adaptive therapy and cancer. Is that what I understand? Uh, yep. So we're, we're going to be continuing on the evolutionary winds uh, section of adaptive therapy. Excellent. Okay. We hope to see you guys at the next club of med. Thanks a lot for tuning in. And thanks especially to David for a great talk. Thanks everybody. Thanks, David. Awesome. Thanks so much.